All right, well, do you want to start by just talking us through, are these the actual cameras that you used in, uh, in combat any of them? This little baby is an original item. This is 1965, which I guess is a year before the Battle of Long Term. This one is last year's Digital Insanity from Leica. But the nice thing about the Leica is you can swap the lenses over from the old body to the new body. And as you well know, the, <clears throat> the efficacy of a camera, the, the greatness of any camera is, is not the actual camera, it's the, it's the glass on the front end. And there's something magical, I mean, which it, it's hard to explain to people who are not in photography, that a Leica lens has this slight fall off on the edge. I mean, it's almost like you've vignetted, but it's not vignette, it's a, an even fall off where it's sharp to the, abs you know, to the rim of the, of the frame and it gives you a <clears throat> gives you hair on the on the it gives you hair on the balls as it were it's it's got something which you cut you don't get out of a Canon out of a Nikon out of anything else and the other thing about this baby it can go underwater you can open a beer bottle with it you can pound a nail or a tent peg and if you've got short people blocking your vision at a big press conference, you just tap them on the back of the neck with it. And they tend to bob down at that point. Um, and it's weird coming out here and shooting in a Vietnam Atmo. I suddenly realize, wow, this was so slow to change. You've got to take the bottom off, rewind the film, push the button, rewind. And then you've got a bobbin and the film. And we used to do that under fire. I mean, we're not being shelled or any kind of shit like that now, but it was to change a roll of film in this thing, you were, it was like having your pants down. You were caught, you were caught offside. And even with a, a Nikon, you still had to take the back off and drop the film out. And with this, there's no film. And I don't have to think. Whereas with this, you're thinking. I mean, sorry, I'm not being rude about digital. You can, you couldn't get it wrong. Yeah, you got it wrong. You could correct it a little bit in the in the dark room. You could push pull a little bit. But unless you were within a stop or two, it was overexposed bin. And you never saw your film. I mean, now I look in the back of the camera. I screwed up. Reshoot. Back then, every frame counted. And I sometimes surprise myself. I pick up an old contact sheet. If you can remember that. I go. And you can instantly pull it to see the picture the one that counts, I mean, it's right there. So you become your own best editor in the end. And without being rude about it, how many people who shoot digital or shoot with their smart device, whatever it is, edit the pictures, download them, crop them, sue them, tag them, one in a hundred? Whereas as soon as you've got a contact sheet, or even you've got like, you know, 37 happy snaps, you know, from back from Rabbit. Okay, Rabbit doesn't exist anymore, okay. Um, you know which frame is gonna go. You know which frame you can put onto the, onto the drum scan and send off to the world, as it were. Um, it's, it's, it's weird to come back here and put it to practice again. I mean, I hate to think of how many I've cocked up today. Um, I mean, maybe I haven't. Maybe the, the magic touch is still there, I don't know. It's, it's such a hard call, because I'm, I'm, I won't see this until middle of next week, you know, which is a bit sort of disappointing, really. Not really, it's, 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 it's stepping back in time, but then I like to think, I mean, I I'm almost think of myself as Jurassic Park. I mean, it, it sounds weird, but I mean, all the processes that we used to go through photographically, I mean, you're aware of this, 
are just out the window now. I mean, everything is, is on a screen, everything is instant, everything is without too much thought. I shouldn't be rude about people using digital cameras. It's There's something very reassuring about going back to trying to make one frame rather than a whole sequence of images and having to then edit them out and delete them and throw them away. Um, I mean, I can't recall that I've actually thrown away a roll of a film I shot in Vietnam. I mean, you go through the film and I mean, you go through the contact sheet and you take your China graph and you, and you mark it off and then it, you go in the dark room and you make yourself a nice print. Um, when was the last time you sat down, downloaded the camera and then went and made a print? A few people do it. Next question. Do you, uh, well, do you want to talk a little bit, just maybe introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your experience in Vietnam? Oh, okay. I know that's a giant question, but is there a, is there a simpler way that you can give us a kind of a, a, a vibe of that? Okay, sorry. Um, My name's Tim, Tim Page, and I earned my stripes, I suppose, in a certain sense by covering the war in Vietnam for just on four years until I was blown away, shot in the brain and paralyzed for a year. And I started this business, this photographic thing, back in the mid-60s, actually in 64, in, in Laos, during a, an attempted revolution. And for that, the UPI, United Press International, sent me down to Vietnam to be a, a staff photographer for $90 a week. My bureau chief was making 80 bucks a week, Henri Huet. And after a probationary period of three and a half months, four months, I was fired for not going in the field enough, trashing my equipment in the field and smoking dope in the office. Now, I don't know which is the most serious of those crimes when it comes to a war zone. Um, I've still got the cameras. Um, it was basically a, a thing between me and the, the bureau chief who, in the whole year he was in Vietnam, um, never went in the field once, although his wife got togged up in tight skin tiger suits and went out and shagged special forces guys and stuff. He never went in the field. He went back in 72 and got himself a big prize for being out in the field. Um, I won't mention his name. It's spelt Dirk Halstead. Um, and he runs that big international uh, Canon blog site out of, out of Washington. Um, we're now mates since I did the book Requiem. And he came to the Requiem show and for the first time in my life I got a compliment from him. Anyway, after I was fired, I speak fluent French, so I got a job with Paris Match. They still owe me the $400 for the month's work. And we went out and almost one of the first jobs I did for them was, was on the relief of a special forces camp up in the Central Highlands in the Red Dust. And a regiment of South Vietnamese troops went in to relieve the camp. And on the way in, the convoy was ambushed and there were bodies everywhere, and North Vietnamese bodies, and there was the build-up towards the Battle of the Yard Trang. And we, we got into the ambush site on this gunship, and I got the French correspondent with me. And I looked round, we'd just landed in the middle of the road, with bodies and tanks and all nine yards. And I looked around, and the guy climbed on the, on the chopper, which came in afterwards to get the wounded, and he's taken the extra film and the long lens with him. And about 24 hours later, no, about 36 hours later, I got back to Saigon in the middle of the night on a plane taking bodies down to Saigon. And the Life magazine limo was at the airport and the driver got out of the car and said, here's $300 for the film. Well, my loyalty changed from Parry Match to Life at that moment. And I didn't get, they didn't use the pictures but they said, would you like to work for us? And the next assignment I went out was with 173rd in very much territory like this in the Iron Triangle, rubber trees, bush. 
and we're on a road cut through the rubber plant, old rubber plantation. And the road had been pianoed where they'd cut it so cars and vehicles couldn't get down the road, you know, ditches stuck across it. There was a sign on the side of the road, and they called the interpreter over and he said, What's that sign? He said, All American read this, die. And behind the sign was a 105 millimeter shell, and there were 19 dead and 35 wounded in seconds. I mean, the weird thing about combat is you think that a firefight, a battle has gone on for hours and it's only this long. I mean, time condenses, goes crazy on you. And uh, there were just bodies every, I mean, it was a narrow road and so it was, we were wiped out. I, luckily I was with the unit just off scene, so we didn't get badly hit. And as I was taking a GI to the chopper, which was 150 meters down the road, his leg came off in my arm. And I kept shooting with one hand and I got back to Saigon X hours later, walked into the life office and the manager of Hello Dolly, a, a musical from the 60s, which was playing in Vietnam, was in the office organizing for life to shoot Hello Dolly. And I walked in and I was just covered in fucking blood. And I was, I mean, it, was, it was a bad day. And they gave me a dirty look for walking into the office and looking like a survivor. And five pages in Life magazine. A week after that, I got caught in another ambush when I, we stormed a hill with the Marines. And the platoon I was with, which was about 42 guys, there was only 20 effectives at the top of the hill. So I think of uh, Operation Starlight. And that was six pages in life. And I haven't had a job since. I mean, I haven't had a regular... No, I, I suppose I do lie. I've had odd jobs. I did three months in Afghanistan for the UN as a... I was an ambassador. I was a, a, a photographic peace ambassador, which meant I was teaching Afghans and covering the elections. Um, time Life gave me a year contract after I was sapped the fourth time which was 1969 in April. And the guy in front of me, three meters away, stepped on a landmine, blew his legs and arms off, and went 50 feet in the air, and I got a piece of shrapnel about this big in my brain, and my guts were out. And staggered back to the chopper and collapsed on the skid. And nine hours of neurosurgery and four hours of gut surgery and I was paralyzed for a year and a half after that. Um, took a bit of coming back from, and time life were not exactly generous. I was on $200 a week. And then they gave me a job for a year in Rome and said, then they said, piss off. Um, I haven't had a job since, and here I am on the movie set playing Vietnam. It's weird as, weird as wireless. And do you want to continue? Like, how, how does it feel? I mean, obviously we're as far from a war zone as we can be. But is it strange for you to see the guys in, in uniform and, you know, moving in formation? Does it's it... flashback. It's, it's... The... Compared to the American troops, we were very strack. Australians were very together. There was no smoking, there was no armed forces radio playing Hendrix. There was no... It was strict military discipline. We didn't take the casualties. We didn't lie about the, or we didn't blag about the, the kill rates, the, you know, the body counts. Um, the area we controlled, which was Phuc Thuy province and Phuong Tau, was pacified to the point that people went to market, shopped, and the roads were open even at night. And whenever you went out with the I mean, I went out with 1st Ra, 6th Ra, 5th Ra. You always felt like you're going to come back. You always felt secure. I mean, I mean it's, it's a hard... There are certain units, certain Vietnamese units, certain American units, which are heavy drafty units. And the field discipline was, was dodgy. 
people not moving properly, making noise, yakking, radios on, smoking all the time. I mean, I'm a heavy dope smoker. I'm known for it. I mean, Dennis Hopper is based on me in Apocalypse, theoretically. I never saw diggers smoke in the, in the NARM. Yeah, off duty on I mean, at the back of the base, but never in the field. Whereas American units were overrun because they'd all got stone over their heads and, you know, <laughs> shit happens. Um, it was always, so to see people wearing the old floppy boonies and the Aussie bush shirt is still the best bush shirt. I, mine don't fit anymore, but that's another story. Um, is kind of sets me back at wrong word and go, wow. I mean, you've got to remember, it's 50 bloody years ago, mate. It's 50 years. I have trouble remembering what I had for breakfast yesterday. I mean, not quite. I'd had bacon, but, you know, it's, um, it's hard to, 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 to bring it back because you, to avoid all that PDST nonsense, that's not nonsense, all that stuff, you somehow got to take that chip out and ditch it and forget it. Not, I mean, you don't ever forget it completely, but you don't want it tripping through your head. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me seeing these dudes with 16s and 60s and what have you. I mean, it conjures up stuff and maybe I'm trying in a photographic sense, I'm trying to make an image which parallels, wrong word maybe, tries to not replicate, but tries to say something in the same way that I said it 50 years ago. I mean, that's not just being a mercenary because I'd like to think of having an exhibition of pictures I shoot over the next few days and match it with a picture I shot back then. Um, and for some, a strange reason going back to film and trying to shoot it in something which is going to be a, a print that's going to last forever well <laughs> be reasonable it's going to last feels good i mean it, it it i'm i'm it's the opposite of being upset it's a bit spooky i say spooky it's kind of i've babbled more vietnam war stories this morning than i have for years. I mean, people stop asking you questions after a bit. I mean, you know, another fucking boring war story. There's a line in a very good book. If you ever want to read one book on Vietnam, it's called Dispatches by a guy called Michael Herr. Her. And he wrote the uh, script for Apocalypse and he wrote the script of Full Metal Jacket. And the last line in Dispatches is a war story is just a story anyway. And no war story, every war story people tell you, they never end. You talk in half sentences to people who are vets. I can, and you remember Long Tan and that mortar. You don't have to finish the sentence because everybody knows what happened. You don't need to fill in that blank on the crossword puzzle. It's a strange thing when you get with another bunch of vets, it's all kind of like you're, you're on the same vibe, you're on the same you know, network, it's, 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 it's uncanny. I suppose it's not, I suppose all people who, who suffer conflict and war go through that same emotion. I mean, it's, I mean, I've had more shrinks than I've had hot dinners, so it's, uh, it's a strange one. <laughs>